Hello, assalamu alaikum everybody. I'm live again today on Sunday. I want to start by first of all saying thank you all for your lovely feedback and comments and all of your questions and the support you've been giving me for these lives. You know, it isn't easy for me to just come in here and show my face and do a live like this. So your support has been really really good it's really kind of given me the push and that you know made me dare to come in here and talk and share with all of you and um, also thank you for those of you who've reached out and sent your questions and your messages and I'm so happy to hear that a lot of you who have been struggling and have been finding this time at home with your children really difficult I'm so happy to hear that these lives have cheered you up and have motivated you and that it's made a difference and that's exactly what I want is to know that those children that you have in your home have now got a happier more motivated uh, more excited mum at home and that they can benefit from that so that's lovely so thank you so much for sharing that uh, all of that feedback with me um, today I wanted to actually share a personal story so a lot of you you know me as Naseba the principal at Rumi Montessori or Naseba the Montessori teacher and trainer um, but you don't actually know me as Naseba the mum or the homeschooling mum so I haven't really spoken too much about my journey as a mother or as someone who homeschooled um, but actually I did spend quite a period of my life homeschooling my son but he's now 16 so we have a very kind of different dynamic so I'm not going to be showing you all those photos of our little child doing you know different kinds of activities and exploring his interests but there was a time that I was doing that and that's why I want to share with you in this video because I think that some of you might be inspired and you might find some answers to questions that you may have had um, so I'm going to start right at the beginning. So I actually trained as a Montessori teacher about two years before I had my son. And then when I had him, um, for the first year and a half, I was a stay-at-home mum with him, and I just did very basic activities. Um, we didn't have all the resources that we have now. We didn't have things like Pinterest and um, Instagram, Facebook. There wasn't all this um, platforms where you can see what other people did. We used a Yahoo group, so there was like a really basic Montessori Yahoo group where I was on, and sometimes we would be talking and discussing things, but there really wasn't that much available for us at that time. So I was already trained, thankfully, which meant that I could follow the philosophy that I had learnt and I could apply that with, with um, my son Noah, but it wasn't through materials that I was applying it. It was very much just applying the philosophy, seeing what he was interested in as a baby and giving him plenty of opportunity to follow that interest. Um, I remember that things like reading a book, I would always make sure that when he was, um, even from after birth, whenever he was looking at the page of a book, I would make sure that I don't turn the page until his concentration is gone. So I was, everything I was doing was with this light of um, ensuring that he can maximize his concentration, um, giving him plenty of opportunity for movement and also expanding his language. I knew really early on um, from, let's say, the first few months that um, Noah was autistic. Because I was trained, I could kind of see some of the signs. And for me, when I saw those signs, I didn't see it as a problem, but I saw it as a gift because I know that you know all children who have some kind of special needs, they also have some kind of amazing gift or talent that you don't know. So for me, it was like, oh, this is exciting. He's not just going to be the typical child. There's going to be a lot more to this journey. And um, I remember being eager to watch and see how he grows and develops and um, seeing those, those signs of autism come in and seeing how we work through with him with a lot of that. So for the first year and a half, it was just very much, very much a natural way of parenting, following his interest, you know, giving him lots of hands-on uh, things that he can explore, giving him things like the treasure basket, which you can Google, that's suitable for children who are around um, six months. Um, and then when he was about a year and a half, I, was, I had to go back to work. I think this is something that a lot of us face is that we don't have the luxury to stay at home or you know sometimes we're in situations that we are we are alone um, and we are single parents and we have to go back to work or even if we have our you know husbands there we still have to also work so I didn't have that luxury to stay at home more than that so when he was about a year and a half I started to go back to work and of course I went back to work as a Montessori teacher but I was always very adamant that if I was going back to work Noah has to come with me so I was always very clear that any employer who wants me, 
I have this son and he's one of my priorities. I'm not going to kind of just leave him on the side. So what would happen is I set up a three to six classroom and I had Noah come in with me at the age of one and a half. Uh, I had activities set up for him. He kind of, he knew how to do things like pouring and building the pink tower and lots of different activities. I would have him in the classroom with me and I always made sure I worked part time. So it was just the morning he would come in with me, he would work. Uh, with different activities. He was a lot younger, so he did need things like to nap and, and he did need a slightly different setup in the classroom, which we, I provided for him. And he would come in with me and then in the afternoon we would be at home and then I'd be doing different activities and things like that with him. When he got to about the age of three, um, that's when I actually moved back to England because I was living abroad before that. So I actually moved back to England and then I got another job working at Happy Days Montessori, which is in England, with um, a lady called Margaret Delane, who's an amazing Montessorian. And again, it was really lovely because um, Margaret allowed me to work part-time, so I worked just the mornings, and I was able to bring Noah in with me. At that time, he was about two and a half to three, so he would come in with me to the, class to the classroom, and he would um, enjoy the morning with the other children, but in the afternoon, we would then you know, do our kind of homeschooling or our activities by ourselves at home. So the way that I had it organized is that in the morning he would come in, it was more that he would enjoy the environment, he would enjoy the other children, he would enjoy the other teachers, and he had some favorite teachers there, which he still loves talking about. And then he would come home and we would have a really basic setup. So we didn't have a special room for his homeschooling and we didn't have um, this big shelf with loads of materials. We just had a really basic shelf and I only had out very limited things, let's say about six to eight things that he was currently working on. And, you know, at that time, we were not in the position to buy loads of Montessori material. So I made lots of things like, the, for example, the bead stairs. I made my own bead stairs. I got the beads. I got the wire. I just made the bead stairs for him to practice with. A lot of the things I just made by myself. And they were, again, very much focused on his interest and the level that he's at and the kind of activities that I can work with him, um, do with him. Um, what was really nice about that, that time was that we had a very, very nice routine. In the morning, we would get up, we would go to school, he would be in the classroom with me, and then lunchtime, we would have our lunch together, we would then go to the park. Um, he got to spend like two to three hours a day in the park. We actually lived where our flat was backing onto the park, so it was kind of part of our daily routine that we'll come home, we'll park the car outside our flat, but we would go straight to the park and we would spend some time there. He would get to run, he would get to practice his gross motor skills, he would collect all sorts of natural stuff. He used to love catching bees, so he had all this opportunity for nature. And then once he, we were done in the park, we would then come upstairs to our flat, and that's when we would do our learning activities. So it's kind of like semi-homeschooling, but I had to work at the same time. I'd always wished that I could just homeschool him and I always thought that it would be so brilliant if I could just give my full attention and focus to him and his learning but I wasn't in that position so I made it work and this is one of the things that I want to share with you those of you who want to homeschool your children those of you who have this you know you really want to do it but at the same time you have to work it is possible at that time I wasn't working from home but there are so, nowadays there's so much work you can do from home and homeschool your children so you know don't give up if you feel that you are a working mum and that you don't have the time for your children, don't give up. There are so many workarounds it. And that's what I did. I worked in the morning, I had our lunch, we had our lunch, we went to the park, we came home and we did like, you know, maybe two hours of activities together. Um, his setup was always really, really basic. Up until that point, it was a really basic setup. I didn't have like a special, you know, brilliant shelf that I bought for him. I just used whatever shelving was available. I just made sure things were accessible and I limited what I had available for him. So I'd have one section where I have his activities and then I would have another section where I would have um, his toys and those would all be organized. So remember in yesterday's uh, live, I spoke about how Montessori is applicable to your whole life. So that's why even things like your toys, you can arrange them using the Montessori philosophy. So everything was in baskets, everything was organized according to you know what, whatever toy it was. And it was very clear for him to see whether he had completed it or not. 
So we arranged everything really nicely. And um, Noah was uh, quite independent in the flat in that he was able to just get up in the morning early. He used to get up really, really early. He would get up really early and he'd be able to help himself to a basic snack. He'd be able to take his toys and play with them. He loved books. So I would have so many books available and he would literally just read through the books for hours and hours and hours until I got up. Um, so that was really nice that we had that independent setup that he could kind of help himself around the home. Um, and there's a question, do I only have one child? Yes, I, I have one of my own biological children, but I see everyone as my child. <laughs> so yes, I have my own child, Noah, but you know, I really, really feel like these other children, they're mine, but they're just not living with me. And I just don't have them, you know, day to day, but I love them as much as I would have loved, loved them as my own children. So um, that's what we did with him until he was about five. Um, it worked really nicely because I was also studying. So not just homeschooling, I was homeschooling and I was working and I was studying. But um, it worked nicely because I could study, so I could finance my studies and I could do my elementary training. And then um, when he got to about the age of five, just before he turned six, um, there came the opportunity for me to actually come away from the work environment and set up a classroom in my house and provide homeschooling for Noah, but also for other parents. So I took that jump and that was in around, I think, 2000 and late 2008, 2009. So I took that leap. I left the uh, security of my job and um, I still had the support from Margaret Delaney that I was working with previous to that, but I took the leap. I um, set up a um, classroom in my house. Um, it was always my living room. So I always set up the living room as my classroom. And I had lots of families who were also homeschooling their children. And they just wanted to bring their children for let's say three or four mornings a week. And they would come for about two and a half hours to three hours every morning. Um, and they would be in the classroom with Noah and I would work with them. And at the same time, I'd be working with the parents and guiding the parents and showing the parents what kind of activities that they can do. And this was probably the, you know, the, the loveliest time of my journey teaching my son. Because when I came away from that work environment, I was able to really, really, really focus on him and his needs and his activities and his interests. And I was able to have that flexibility that sometimes I would um, cancel a day of, 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 of our homeschool because we would go off and do something else. We'd go to the bird park or we'd do something else. So I had that flexibility and I really, really loved that time. Um, it was a really beautiful time and I had got to meet some really, really nice families that I'm still in contact to this day. And I got to introduce lots of people to Montessori who had never really known about Montessori. And that aspect as a teacher, where I was working with lots of children, I still had that aspect um, where I was working with all these children. So I still had that aspect, but it wasn't as rigorous and as kind of like stressful as a school environment can be. So I did that for about two years and I was I really loved that. I had no intention of changing. Um, you can actually look at a lot of my work during that period if you go to my really old blog, thelearningarc.com, uh, or the Learning Art blog store, I think it is. You can see the blog there, and um, it's really, really old, so there'll be lots of different stuff on there. I'm not quite sure what's on there. Hopefully there's nothing too personal on there, but you can have a look on there and you can see you know, the kind of environments I set up. We moved around a lot. So every time I moved house, I just set up the classroom in the living room, wherever it was that we were. Um, and the living room was basically our classroom. And um, you know, it was really lovely. We didn't have many materials. So I would make a lot of materials myself. And this is one of the things that I really want to stress to everybody that in this day and age, the materials are so accessible for us to buy. But, you know, take it back 20 years ago, people couldn't buy materials. They had to make them themselves. And even in Maria Montessori's times, you know, the materials would have to get made and they would take time. So you would kind of improvise. You wouldn't keep the child waiting and not allow them to explore that interest because you don't have that material. No, you would improvise and you would do it in another way that still follows the philosophy, but isn't, um, going to stop the child from learning. So this is one of the things that I really want to make sure everyone can take back from this is, is you can do this Montessori with limited resources. And I always had limited resources, but I built up my resources really, really slowly. 
So I loved what I was doing when we had this homeschool co-op set up at home and we had maybe about 10 to 12 different families, not all coming at the same time, but we had families and you know, I started doing a bit of training for um, other parents who were homeschooling and stuff like that. And then when it came to 2011, there was a Montessori school opening up in my local community and at first they asked me to help them as a consultant because that's another thing that I was doing, a school consultancy. And I was fully on board to help them as a consultant and um, you know, I was really happy to do that but it got more than a consultant and I could see that they needed more help and they needed more support and before I knew it I kind of landed myself in a full-time job as the person who was responsible for running and setting up all of the school. So I went from being at home and having that lovely, lovely time with Noah to suddenly being, you know, working 24-7. Um, and I basically would leave my house maybe around um, 6.37, you know, between that time, depending on how I was getting to work. And I would be there till really, really late in the evening. Sometimes we wouldn't come home until 7 or 8 p.m. So that kind of cancelled out all the homeschooling. So before that, I was a homeschooler, and then everything was kind of cancelled out after that. And I was in this situation where... Uh, I was working, it was a big responsibility, but I also had Noah and I really wished that I could have given him that time. And what I tried to do, because again, the message I want to get to you is that no matter what circumstance you're in, you can still help your child, you can still provide them opportunities to learn and develop. So what I tried to do was um, I made sure he was always with me, so he was always at work with me. So he would come in with me in the morning, he would have his breakfast, he, he knew how to have his breakfast there. You know, the environment was a Montessori classroom, um, so that it was quite comfortable for him. Um, he was the eldest child there. There wasn't an elementary at that time. It was just three to six classes when he was about six, seven or something like that. And um, I would just set up activities for him, just like I did at home. And, you know, he would work with those while I was busy running the school and so on. And he would then do loads of reading. We used to have lots of his books in the school. We had lots of, you know, the, the school became like his second home, basically. So even if you're in a working environment, you can create that for your child. You can make that working environment like a second home for your child. And I would try as best as possible, wherever I could, to bring in um, different materials for him and to follow his interests. But it was really a struggle because when you're anyone who is a Montessori teacher who's run a Montessori school and managed it and managed all aspects of like the teachers and everything, you know it's really challenging. It's not something that, <laughs> that is light. I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of effort that goes into running a Montessori school. So it's a huge, huge responsibility. And I wanted to make sure that I did it well and that those children who attended there could get the best, just like I wanted Noah to get the best. I wanted to make sure they could get the best. And so I put all that effort into it. And that was kind of when our homeschooling journey ended and it was more like Noah was being taught in the classroom, but he was still being taught with me. So I still had that lovely aspect, which was I was teaching my own child. And then we did that for about five years, and then, um, then we came to Malaysia. As soon as we came to Malaysia, I was like, I'm never going to go into that nine to five job again. <laughs> I'm never ever going to do that. I'm never going to be working full time. I'm like, thank God I'm not, you know, I don't have to work full time in Malaysia. And I stepped back from that position. And um, by that time, Noah was already 12. So he was 12. He was very independent in his learning. He could just um, follow his own interests. He knew himself how to follow his interests. So if he was interested in cars, he knew exactly how to find out information about cars. Um, I never gave him a tablet or a phone or access to a computer. So he knew how to research using books and real resources. And also he knew how to find people in our community that you know, he would remember everyone's professions and everyone's interests and he would be able to go to those people and ask those people all sorts of questions about the interest that he had. So let's say he was interested in cars, he would go around looking at the different cars, he would, he would actually, he's autistic and he's really shy, but somehow when he was interested in something, he would have the courage to go up to a total stranger on the street and ask them about their Land Rover. So he did that, he, he had that confidence to do that. So he's you know, been a very much an independent learner, which is a big blessing. Um, and that's very much because of the way that I raised him right from the beginning of following his interests. So with Noah, if he finds himself interested in something, he doesn't need me or any other teacher to tell him how to learn about it. He doesn't need us to, 
you know, find resources for him anymore. He doesn't need us to, um, you know, guide his learning in that sense. If he's truly interested in something, he will just study it to the deepest level possible independently. And he would seek out all of the resources that he needs. And he would say to me, Mum, can you buy me some books about um, uh, cars? Mum, can you buy me some books about boxing? Mum, can you buy me some books about this? And then I would, you know, order books for him and he would go through the books. He would also ask to go to the library. He would ask to speak to experts. So that's a really beautiful quality that's been developed from the Montessori method, this ability to be able to follow your own interests and your own learning. And that is even present to now. Right now, uh, Noah is currently downstairs in the kitchen and he's pickling and trying to make his own um, uh, chili sauce. Right, so he's, it's really, I don't know exactly what he's doing, but he's pickling and then he's trying to blend things and make, uh, you know, chili sauce and he's kind of has all these mini bottles of all his samples and his, you know, like, and this is telling me this is the byproduct of this and this one has added that and it's kind of like an experiment for him. So he doesn't need me to be there with him and to say to him, okay, let me teach you how to pickle. Let me teach you how to this. He's just independent. And that's one of the beautiful things that has come from his Montessori education and also from the fact that I've always followed his interest. It's not that the materials made him like that. It's the philosophy that made him like that. Again, I'm trying to emphasize the importance of the philosophy. So it's the philosophy of following his interest that has made him like that. So at the age of 16, anything he wants to study, he can just do it himself. He doesn't need anyone to guide him. He will just go ahead and do it himself. So. After the age of 12, until about the age of, um, you know, just a few months ago, he, I wasn't teaching him. So I stepped down from that teacher, uh, kind of homeschooling mother position, and I just wanted to be his mum. So I just wanted to be his mum. We had so much uh, intensity in that period where I was working, so I felt like we just needed that time to come away from that and just enjoy our time together. And he was because he's very much self-directed, I just let him be. And he, you know, researched loads of different things himself. It's only recently in, in this um, lockdown period that he started saying to me, mommy, I miss it when you teach me. Will you teach me again? <laughs> so he has got some teachers who teach him things like, like um, my husband teaches him some uh, things. He's learned to read Jawi, which I posted a video on one of my stories. Uh, Jawi is basically Malay, but written with Arabic script. So um, I have no clue what any of it says, but he's learned to read Jawi. He learned, he can speak Malay fluently in like straight away. He's very linguistic. So he will just learn any language. You put him in any environment, he'll just learn the language, you know, within a few months. So he's very much a linguistic. So he, you know, he has some things that he's learning with my husband. Um, earlier this year, he told me that he wanted to try going to a boarding school. So this is something that comes up with children who are in their older stages. They might want to be independent and they might want to go away from you and go somewhere else and try a, um, try a school environment. So we actually put him in a boarding school and he was there from January till the middle of March when the lockdown happened. And after being there for a few months, he's like, Mommy, I don't want to be here anymore. Mommy, please, 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 Mommy. <laughs> you know, he was like, please, mommy, I want to be home. I want to be home. You know, I want to study by myself. So, but it was a good experience for him. So it's only now, which is the last few weeks, that he's asked me to teach him again. And so I've decided that I'm going to teach him uh, mathematics. He's working on his IGCSE. He's studying independently. But I love mathematics. So I said to him, I will teach you mathematics. So we've been doing every day we'll do a little bit um, on the mathematics curriculum together. But other than that, all of his learning is just independent learning. It's just individual learning. And he has a lot of free time. He's not studying uh, kind of hours and hours a day. He's got a lot of free time just to be himself. So that's my journey of teaching and homeschooling and um, raising my son. And you can see that, you know, in that I was working, in that I was studying. At times we were homeschooling at home. At times we were teaching him in, the, in school. And um, what I want to really emphasize here is that whatever your situation is, you can make it work with your child. Sometimes we're in a situation where we don't have the, all of the opportunities that we, don't, we want, we don't have the facilities we want, we don't have the space, 
you know, sometimes we have to work and we can't be at home with our children. Whatever situation that you're in, you can still apply Montessori as a parent. You can still apply it to your child's life. Remember, even if you send your child to school, they're only in school for a short amount of time. And what you do in the rest of the time and the way that their home environment is, that's going to have one of the biggest impacts on the child. So I wanted to share this so that all of you can see that it's not um, always going to be rosy and easy. And you know, we feel a lot of pressure, especially now, because when we go online, we see all these perfect pictures of um, homeschooling houses and we see these perfect examples of mothers who are homeschooling and you know and a lot of the times we look at them and we begin to feel down and people have shared that with me they can share that they've shared that with me and they've told me that they've been feeling depressed or they've been feeling like they're not a good enough mom because they just look at all this stuff and they think I don't do that for my child right but you know the thing is is that you don't have to do all of it you don't have to the most important thing is is not that you create that perfect environment the most important thing is you understand your child and understanding and connecting with your child is very much something you can do with nothing. It's just a very much, a, a, a very natural connection with your child. Even if you have very limited resources, you can follow your child's interests. You can understand your child. You can create an environment in which they can be independent. And if you're one of those mothers who's following this, and I know there's a lot of you who are following this, and you're, you have to work, you love the idea of homeschooling, but you have to work, then sh shape your life so that you can do both. Work, but have times that you can do things with your children that are learning activities. Create a, a Montessori home environment so that at least when your children are coming back from school, they're going to that home environment. You don't have to give up if that's your circumstance. That's basically you know, the big message from this video today. And if you have limited resources, just use whatever you have. A lot of people say, I love Montessori, but it's too expensive, I can't do it. And then I think, well, hang on a minute. When Maria Montessori set up her Montessori school, the first one, it was in the slums of Italy, you know? Um, and she just set it up with whatever was available, whatever people would give and whatever was available. So use what you have use what you have and in my opinion knowledge learning about Montessori the knowledge that you gain through doing a course or through reading books is more valuable than the materials that you buy because when you build yourself up and you have the knowledge you will see your child differently you will approach your child differently and your child will grow differently but the materials are not going to do that for you so you know wherever you are Whatever your circumstances, you can take something away from the Montessori method and you can apply it to your life and your child can benefit. And even if you have an older child, you can still apply the Montessori method. Some people, they say to me, oh, my child, children are all already teenagers and I've missed all this time and I feel so guilty because I didn't know any of this. It's not too late. You can start straight away. Even if your, um, your children are adults, you can just approach them differently from the Montessori approach. And there's one lovely grandmother on, uh, on Instagram who is showing, sharing her activities that she does with her grandchildren. And, and it's, I love seeing it, it's amazing. She's doing all these activities and all of these things, applying Montessori for her grandchildren. And you know, it's never too late. You can always learn something. And when you learn about the Montessori method, even if you don't have children, it changes you. It changes you and your view of the world. So that's basically the message that I wanted to give in this video today. There is a few questions, so let me just scroll down to see. So one of the questions is that um, I have multiple children and I feel I don't have time to learn certain methods to teach them. For example, grammar. So this is another thing which people, a problem that a lot of people um, say, t say to me, they say that they have children in different planes of development, you know, how can they keep up with all of their children? How can they um, give um, every single child what they need? Um, one of the students on the intensive Montessori course that I was doing was a mum with three children and in the course you have to take videos of yourself presenting and send them to me and I give you feedback and her videos were always the nicest videos ever because it was so real like real 
homeschooling. She was presenting a lesson to her daughter at the dining table. She had a two-year-old or something on her lap who was trying to kind of grab the materials. And then she had another child who's about six or seven calling her from across the room, asking her something, all in one presentation. It was, it was so real, it was so beautiful. I loved, loved watching it. Um, you know, when her younger child who was sitting on her lap was grabbing the material, she gave him one of the flowers to hold and he was holding it and she was just naming it for him. And then she would continue working with the cultural cards that she was showing her daughter. And she would answer her son and then she would continue. It doesn't have to be perfect. When you have all of your children together, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just let it be natural. Do the best you can but let it be natural. This is your life. You know, it's not, you're not make, you don't have to make it perfect for anybody. Just make what works for you. Don't stress yourself out about it. Just make, make it however it works for you. So things like not having enough knowledge about the curriculum. I know that this is something that can really um, stress people out where they feel like they don't know how to teach certain subjects and their child is getting older and they need to learn more. And this is one of the aspects that I'm really, really trying to help people with. And that's why I created those self-paced online courses that you can pay, you can access anytime, you can see the materials on there, you can see the videos on there. We have pretty much most of the three to six curriculum already on there. So it's divided into individual courses. You can choose the one that's suitable for you. Uh, you know, this is how I'm trying to help with that section. I do recommend that you um, try to learn how to use the materials either through joining a course or through doing a really good, getting a really good album or something like that. I do recommend that. And at the same time, don't feel like you have to do it all now. If you are a little bit late teaching your child grammar, it's not going to harm them. It's not going to harm them. Do the best you can now. Make your plan. And um, I'm going to be talking about how you can try to plan your future as well with the homeschooling plan, your homeschooling plan, how you want to teach things, when you want to start things. Because planning is also really, really helpful. Because let's say you know your child is going to be you know, interested, they're going to be six, seven, they're going to be ready for grammar in six months. It's good if you start planning from now so that by that time it comes, you're ready. This is really, really important aspect. So I will actually be doing lots of elementary videos as well. Those ones I have, I'll be working on them this year. So I'll be putting uh, things like the elementary grammar curriculum and you know the different materials, the great lessons and sort of things as those self-paced videos as well. And I hope that that's going to help you as um, parents to access the knowledge easily when you are homeschooling your children. I'm just going to flick through and see if there's any other questions. One of the questions, um, comments, is that it's easy for us to miss the sensitive periods. And my advice is, yes, it's easy for you to miss the sensitive periods if you don't know what you're looking for. If you know what you're looking for, you're always going to be looking at the child with those eyes. You're always going to be thinking, is that a sign that my child has entered a sensitive period? And so my recommendation is that you learn about the sensitive periods. If you um, get some of the books that I recommended, you'll see information about the sensitive periods on there. And you know, there's also lots of information. You can Google um, the sensitive periods from three to six. You can learn all of that information. And if you've joined my introduction course, where I go through the Montessori philosophy from an Islamic perspective, I talk about the sensitive periods in there. So if you have that knowledge before, and that's why I stress the philosophy, if you have that knowledge before you start the course, uh, sorry, if you have that knowledge before you start homeschooling or when you first begin homeschooling, then you'll be able to check and monitor your child as they grow and develop and know which sense it appears they're being be able to recognize that. So I hope that that has been helpful. I cannot see any other questions. So thank you for the lovely comment, thank you. So I can't see any quest other questions and I hope that um, you know, you've enjoyed this personal journey, which I haven't shared. I'm, I'm going to try to share more specific um, things of what happens with me and my son. I'm going to try and share more things from a mother's perspective, but sometimes I don't do it because he doesn't like me sharing uh, about him or his, what he does. He doesn't like it. He's getting a bit more um, confident about me sharing, um, but I will 
try and share more when he allows me to do that. And also, I will share more about autism in Montessori because I know that there's a lot of you out there who really need that information, so I will share. But sometimes Noah is just like, don't tell people about me. <laughs> I don't want people to know. And I have to kind of respect his privacy and give him his time when he's like that. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>